Good morning. And let me share with you something interesting. Psalms 30, verses 7 to 8. And in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou did hide thy face, and I was troubled. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. The word face in Hebrew is panai, which means the presence. You've hid your presence from me, and I was troubled. And the word trouble is bahal. That runs a gamut. It's in a nifel form. Uh, nifel, it's actually a nifel participle. Um, so it kind of runs the gamut of between bewilderment to terror. That's kind of strange. It's just what state is David in at this point? Um, and he talks about his prosperity. The word prosperity in Hebrew is shalu, which really means security. And in my security, I shall not be moved. Um, by your favor, the word favor is rasan, which is pleasure, by God's pleasure. For his pleasure, he made a mountain to stand strong. I agree with most commentators, this mountain to stand strong is a representation of the physical things in the world that you find security in. Uh, you know, he had security with, as a king, he had bodyguards and he had wealth and um, you know, things were fairly good for him. Uh, but then he says, Thou did hide thy face, and I was behind, terrified, or bewildered, troubled. Um, which was it? Well, I kind of came to understand this first the other day. I had the whole day off from work, had nothing to do, no obligations. And I figured from the time I got up to the time I went to bed, I was just going to study God's Word the whole day. No uninterrupted study of God's Word. I was excited. I, boy, I was going to write up a beautiful study that I was going to put on my, put on my blog and oh, how the brethren would eat it up and I'd be, they'd be so impressed with me and my knowledge of the biblical scriptures. And man, I was ready for it. And I sat down and I figured, now what am I going to write on? I started thumbing through my Bible, trying to find a verse to write on. And the funny thing is, I, I couldn't find any verse. You know, and I even went to social media and people who post scripture verses and seeing if somebody posted a verse that sort of hit me in a way, you know, with that, yeah, this is something I want to search out, but nothing. I was feeling nothing. And of course, you know, a writer can't write anything unless he feels something. And... None, none of the scripture I was reading, I, I wasn't feeling the thing. I wasn't, so usually when I'm writing my studies, you know, I feel God's presence. I feel his pleasure. And in the midst of that pleasure, the words just flow. But this time nothing was coming. I couldn't understand it. God, I devoted this whole day to you to study your word. And I literally, from five o'clock in the morning, to three o'clock in the afternoon, I wasted that time. You ever, you ever try to study and you just waste the whole time? You don't get anything done? That, that was me. I didn't get anything accomplished. I couldn't find any verse right. Some I started writing and I, you know, get through a paragraph or so and say, this is no, you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not getting it. And just the end of it. And by the end of the day, man, I had moved from bewilderment to terror, you know, Baha'u. I began to understand what David meant. You hid your face and I was Baha'u. Initially, I was just bewildered. Why am I not feeling your pleasure, God? And then eventually I began to panic. God, why am I not feeling anything? I always am. What have I done wrong? What's what's going on here? Is this the way it's going to be? I, you know, you actually begin to despair of life itself. If I can't feel God's pleasure and presence, I mean, life could all be so boring, especially for a guy like me who just, you know, has no social life. As an Aspie, you know, I, I don't have that many friends to go out with and do things. And, uh, not a party person and all that. And so, and, you know, I... I, you know, I get no pleasure out of watching television or watching any movies. There, there's nothing else that, you know, I don't have any other hobbies. You know, and that's what kind of hit me. Is that all this is, is a hobby? 
That's my hobby is studying the biblical languages and writing up little studies to delight the brethren. That's when I ran across Psalms 30, 7 to 8, where David is saying that in his prosperity, in the time when he feels secure, everything's okay, you know, he's not moved. He's not shaken in anything. He's, he's very comfortable. And then the Lord just favors him with all the security, surrounding him with the security. Uh, you know, he had a good 401k. He's got a good retirement. He's got a, you know, he's got a good job with a lot of security men around and protecting him. And uh, he knows where his next meal's coming from. Uh, God did that out of his own pleasure to do that. But then, for some reason, he's just not enjoying it. He's not feeling God's pleasure. And that's what happened to me. I wasn't feeling God's pleasure. And I was moving from bewilderment to being terrified. I cried to God, Lord, why? Why can't I just, I just want to feel your pleasure again. And that's when I realized I wasn't doing this study. I wasn't, I didn't. I was having a big party. I mean, this this is how I did. This is my pastime. This is the thing I enjoy doing. I was going to have a big party doing what I enjoy most, and that's studying the Word of God. But, you know, I didn't invite God. I was going to write something that was going to be really impressive, that was going to get the brethren all, brothers and sisters all excited and say, wow, you know, hey, what a wonderful teacher he is. Come, come, we must... Sit under the teaching of this Kaim ben Torah fellow. And that's when it dawned on me. In the words of Jonathan Winters, uh, some of you, you know, if you're an old geezer like me, you remember Jonathan Winters. If you don't, don't worry about it. Anyways, he was a comedian. And in his words, I blew it, honey. I really did. I blew a whole wonderful 10 hours trying to write something that was going to bring honor to myself. I broke the one cardinal rule. And really, this should be a cardinal rule for you pastors, if there's any pastors listening, or any worship leaders. I live everything I write. I don't write to please the brothers and sisters. I just put it up there. But what I'm doing is journaling. It's, jur it's a journal of my life. And, you know, if you're a pastor and you start preaching sermons in order to get your congregation all excited and thrilled, it ain't going anywhere. It's not going to touch them. What's really going to touch your congregation is when you live what you preach. Every sermon you preach, you have to live it yourself. If you're a worship leader, every song you lead your congregation in singing, you've got to live it yourself. You have to experience it yourself. Otherwise, it's going nowhere. Nobody's going to benefit by it. Because it's coming from your mind. It's, you know, you hear some sermon from some mega pastor who preached, and so you preach a sermon you know, put a spin on it and put your own words to it, but pretty much preach the same sermon, expecting the same results. It's not going to happen. Because you didn't invite God to the party. And so, actually, this little study here is the result of that. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing, it's part of my journal. And this was my realization that I started doing a study and writing a study to impress someone rather than journal. Have a little time with God explaining what's going on in my life. You know, every day I drive a disability bus. Uh, there's experiences. There's something new I experienced with God, and I'm so anxious to get home and just write it down, put it on paper. Uh, I guess that's what a writer is. He's got to write it all. And I'm really not aware that I think, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, 
I need something to put up on my blog, so I'll put this up. But I don't write it to put up. I don't write it in order to share this on Facebook. I usually, when you get something that really excites you, you gotta share it. You gotta, you gotta tell others about it, and that's why I do it. But I don't do it in order to impress people, because if I do, it's not gonna come. And I found that out the hard way of losing a good 10 hours of my life sitting there accomplishing nothing, not feeling the presence of God, uh, not feeling anything. You know, there's a story about a rabbi who, you know, one day he was praying and God told the rabbi, you know, you know, he's saying, God, thank you for the opportunity to serve you and I, I, I love serving you as a rabbi. I love teaching and I love mentoring young disciples and, you know I love having uh, the opportunity to just travel around and you know share the Torah with others and God said you know you don't serve me near as much as this shepherd up on the hill shepherd up on the hill serving God what's he doing he's just guarding sheep he's not teaching Torah he's not God said, you go and watch that shepherd a little, and you will see what it's like to serve God. Serve me. And so the rabbi did. And he saw the shepherd off on a hill, off in a distance, and began to observe. And the shepherd was doing the normal things a shepherd would do, tending to his sheep, caring for his sheep. And once his sheep were all corralled in a nice, safe spot, um, and the shepherd pretty much had nothing to do, that's when he looked up in the sky and he says, oh, God... Oh, how I want to serve you, but I, I have no opportunities. I am not like a rabbi who has great knowledge of Torah, who is able to share it with others, who is able to teach. God, there's God of the universe. What can I do to serve you? I know one thing I can do. I got a voice. And I'm going to use that voice to praise you. And he began praising God to the very depths of his being, using everything in his ability to praise God, getting it all out and telling God every possible way, until finally, he, out of exhaustion, he literally became physically exhausted. He just fell to the ground. You know, and Rabbi thought, oh my gosh, he's dead. What happened to him? And after a little while, he got rested up. He stood up again. He said, God... I still have time, and i got to serve you. How can I serve you? I don't know what else to do. i got nothing more. I, I know one thing I can do, God. I can stand on my head and wave my feet. I'm going to do that. And so he stood on his head, waved his feet, and did it for so long until he was totally exhausted. He again fell to the ground, totally exhausted. And the rabbi thought, that's a man who loves God with all his heart, soul, and mind. And he realized I was serving God because I enjoyed the honor. I enjoyed the respect. And yet this simple shepherd did more to serve God by standing on his head and waving his feet than I, as a rabbi who spends hours studying the Torah, hours sharing it with others, sharing my knowledge of the scriptures. Because this shepherd is serving God and showing how much he loved him. And he realized he needed to love God first before he served God. You know, there was a student who I talked to this past week he was taking a Hebrew class out on the East Coast and was really struggling and I wanted to give her some advice um, to help her through the Hebrew class and you know the best advice I gave I could give is the story of um, a salesman who came to a florist one day in a business Florist was busy, so the salesman sat in the office as he did. He noticed a book on the shelf. A book with one title, Roses. And when the florist came back, he said, how can anybody 
write so much. I mean, a book was as thick as a dictionary. How can anybody write so much about one flower? And a florist didn't miss the beat. He said, read the first line in the first chapter. And it said this, if you love it enough, it'll reveal its secrets. You know, you're out there leading worship. You're out there preaching sermons. You're out there teaching. You're out there witnessing. It's of no value if you first don't love God. If you love him enough, the messages will come. And you love him by realizing you're spending time with him. He's with you every moment of the day, every second. And if everything you do, you do is unto him, you will feel his pleasure. Just as that old shepherd, he stood on his head and waved his feet, but he did it unto God, and not for his own benefit.